It's game on for a new stadium for the purple and gold. And the state is in the black. We have those details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Barkey. The state has a little extra money in the checkbook, but that money is already spent. According to Minnesota Management and Budget, the state budget has improved by another $323 million. $5 million will be used to restore the budget reserves. The rest will be used to pay back the school shift. It's good news in the short term, but the long-term outlook remains troubling, according to Commissioner James Showalter. Eight payment shifts. Uh, we're starting to make some starting to make some progress on that, but there's still uh, plenty of work to be done. The fiscal issues that are in front of the state uh, aren't resolved with this forecast or the previous one, and uh, will take uh, quite a bit of effort to uh, resolve. About $2.4 billion of aid payment shifts remain after this is done. We continue to monitor closely cash balances of the state, and we'll continue to have issues uh, associated with making sure that we have liquidity in the state uh, and looking at those projections going forward. And obviously the third issue that we're all very familiar with is the structural balance of the state. And this forecast really makes some relatively minor changes in that balance as well. The bottom line is that the U.S. economy is looking better, but not very much better than was expected. And certainly it's not booming. It's still 2014 before jobs get back to their pre-recession levels. Is the surplus an example of good fiscal policy, or is it past projections that didn't ring true? Those answers vary. You raise taxes, you can look at the marital example, you can look at Illinois, most recently you raise taxes, you never hit the number that you want. If you want a billion dollars in tax increases from revenue, you don't ever hit the number. And that's not my Republican philosophy opinion, that's the math. You can look at Maryland, you can look at Illinois, you can look at Washington State, you can look at New Jersey, all these examples where they expected if you raise taxes, you'll hit this number. We didn't raise taxes, we collected more in revenue. So from that standpoint, I guess you could say that technically we have helped, but the hardworking business women and men of the great state have done a lot of this. And what they have asked, as Senator Senjum said, is just you know calm the waters, balance your budget. We'll then feel confident that you're not going to come back with a new fee, a new tax, you know, some way to ask for more money from us. If they feel confident that the government's not going to come and ask them for more money, they're going to invest in their businesses. You know, it's the health and human service side of this budget where most of the savings is. $230 million of the savings is spending cuts, less spending. 180 of that is in the health and human service area. I mean, the administration is doing a very good job. The early enrollment in MA is producing tremendous savings for the state of Minnesota on our health and human service budget, and the governor really deserves a credit for that. That really was the first act I think that most of us remember him taking when uh, he became governor. MMB Commissioner James Showalter joins me now to talk a little bit about what this board budget forecast means. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So Commissioner, let's begin with the message of this forecast, both in the short term and more importantly in the long term. They seem to be conflicting messages. Hmm. The, this budget forecast shows that we're in a holding pattern, that the good news that we released last December uh, is holding up. There's only about a 1% adjustment in this forecast based upon slightly better revenues, slightly lower spending. And as a result, we have about a $323 million balance. But that all goes away pretty much right away. We have a lot of obligations that are outstanding, a lot of uh, reserves that we've started to replenish and now we're completely replenished, and even more, about $2.4 billion in aid payment shifts to schools that need to be done. So the ending balance here is zero and we're in about the same shape as we started. Zero balance, a little bit better news, uh, the economy's tracking. And without getting too deep in the woods on the actual numbers, let's talk a little bit more about maybe some of the trends, um, particularly with this biennium's budget. The DFL leadership said in those post-news conferences that the GOP, GOP plan really essentially did nothing to impact the actual biennium's budget. It's fair to say that the GOP is going to counter saying it had everything to do with it. Mm -hmm. What's your impression? What we try to do in the forecast is take a look at the economy, uh, actual experience and programs to see what's happening. And those are the kinds of factors that we roll into these estimates. Uh, in the case of health care, what we're finding is that our previous estimates to significant changes in our Medicaid program, allowing single adults to go get health care, well, not as many people who are uninsured are taking advantage of that program. It's not necessarily a change in policy, 
since that end of session is really what were our estimates of how many people would come out and do that. Um, you know, that's more behavior, uh, that's more uh, what's happening in the economy. Okay, so that's um, an argument then that these projections aren't always, aren't always spot on. Absolutely. We uh, always know that these are estimates. These are forecasts uh, taking lots of calculations into account, lots of behavioral assumptions, and no person out there really knows the future. We certainly know we don't. And it was stated that this is the first time the school shifts have been paid back since 2006. So let's, let's look a little bit long term. If budget surpluses continue, would it be your preference that these school shifts get paid back at, maybe at an expedited pace, or do you think it should be a slow and steady payment process? What we have right now in current law is taking any forecast balance that's available. So we don't have like a coupon where we say, well, this year we're going to pay $200 million. Next year we're going to pay $200 million. We really only repay those shifts when we've got money. I, you know, that, that process has worked for us. But I you know, appreciate people looking at this and saying, oh, we don't always have good balances. So you know, that's something I think to look at in the future of how far we want to go, how we want to do it each year so that we can uh, address this uh, re reliably. Okay, let's talk about the out years. And you stated again, you've stated it in the past as well, that there are significant structural issues with our budget. So what would you like to see? What kind of reforms do you think are necessary to make it a less volatile system? Well, I think trying to make it a less volatile system will probably set us up because truly we're in a volatile economy. We're in a volatile time with changes happening at the federal level, something that we talked about extensively in this forecast. You can't predict all those things. So the volatility is going to be there. What we need to be better at is having management ability to deal with that. <laughs> probably watching our reserves, making sure we keep our reserves at the levels that they're at or grow them bigger making sure that we invest in good information, tracking what's happening in our programs and our economy very well, and ultimately getting back to a place where we have a structural balance. You know, we were able to balance the last biennial budget largely through the one-time sources, more shifts, tobacco, revenue bonds. Those don't happen again. They're a one-time event. So we're going to have to find revenues we're going to have to make adjustments to the budget in order to bring it into balance in the next biennium. And you're talking a little bit about finding revenues, and yet the GOP contend that what they're doing is working. And where do you see the relationship, this, this trend of the economy growing and potential tax cuts, particularly corporate tax cuts that the, the Republicans would like to enact? Mm -hmm. Good question. You know, I think what we're always looking at is uh, a, that debate about what's the right tax policy what's the right tax level, what really uh, works. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for uh, others to debate in detail. I think from a fiscal standpoint, though, what's really critical is that we have some predictability, that we aren't changing things every year in, in this large way so that businesses know what's coming, that schools know what's coming, that we all can do our work and probably do it as well as we can, not trying to take into account all the risks that the state government might change the rules of the game next month, next year. It's fair to say that the average Minnesotan doesn't really understand the complexities of the budget. I barely understand them. So uh, let's just, I would like your opinion. Do Minnesotans, can Minnesotans feel good about this budget going into the out years mm -hmm. and, and that their, that their um, best interests are being protected? And I think what's important for uh, everyone to understand is just how sincerely and closely held, uh, there's lots of beliefs here. And so the Capitol is just a great place for those clashes. Uh, and they meet out that dispute, and one way or another that gets done. It's time for the executive branch to implement those uh, policies, and that's what we've been doing. You know, the forecast really shows that things are going a little bit better than we expected. But in the end, you know, we're protecting the taxpayer money. We're giving everyone the information that they need to make decisions going forward. And it's going to be lots of disputes going ahead. Those aren't going to go away. But I think Minnesota state government continues to work really hard to make sure that it does the best job possible. Okay, Commissioner, thanks for analyzing the budget with us. We appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thank you. Governor Mark Dayton stated on Wednesday his jobs plan will be revised next week. Two DFL lawmakers say they plan to move forward with some job legislation. The bill that I'm uh, the chief author of uh, is the Minnesota Investment Fund uh, bill and what it will do is if it's if it becomes law is invest 10 million dollars give 10 million dollars to D the 
Department of Employee and Economic Development. And uh, that money will be used to help spur job creation in that businesses that are willing to commit to uh, investing in significant job creation around the state of Minnesota are given uh, loans that are forgivable. And that really is a, one of the state's primary economic development tools that we can use to help incentivize businesses to stay here in Minnesota. The chair of the Senate Taxes Committee, Senator Julianne Hartman, joins me now to talk a little bit about the budget forecast and some of the impacts. Thank you for joining us on Capitol Report. Always good to be here. Senator, let's begin with something that you stated in the post-announcement newscasts, that the forecast, in your opinion, is one measure of how the economy is doing. So in your opinion, is it the greatest measure? Well, it's an important one for us here as policymakers at the state capitol. It says, how are we doing with managing our budget? And for us, this says that our, our fiscal controls are working. We had a mandate in the, next, the last election to come to the state capitol and resolve that $5.2 billion deficit without raising taxes. Now, with what we've heard today, we've actually turned what was a deficit into a surplus, a $1.1 billion surplus for the state. It's dedicated money, money, so first it's going to be used to pay for cash flow, for a reserve account, and now we have news that we can distribute $300 million in repayments to the schools on that school shift from last year. So this is very good news. It's um, a, a positive outcome after the 5.2 deficit. TFL leaders and the governor did say that the GOP plan essentially had nothing to do with this budget impact and that a majority of the savings came from the early buy-in to Medicaid. It's fair to say that you're going to disagree with that assessment. Yep. So <laughs> which policies do you think did have the greatest impact? Well, I think you should look at it this way. Governor Dayton proposed a $39 billion budget with a $3 billion tax increase to Minnesotans to pay for it. At the end of the day, after the shutdown and all the negotiations, we adopted a budget that spent $35 billion. And so what you're seeing here is actually a $600 million reduction in state spending from the last biennium. So we've reduced state government spending. We didn't increase taxes. We adopted a budget that is $35 billion instead of the $39 billion. So I think it's a very measurable improvement in the state's budget and its economy. Let's look ahead a little bit. If the various shifts are incorporated into the final numbers, the deficit for the next biennium is roughly $4 billion. So is this a time, in your opinion, where corporate taxes should be cut? Well, I, let me take that in several parts there. Okay. Because there's a big assumption that that shift is part of our structural deficit. There's no question that we're going to pay back those schools. But even before the GOP-led Senate and House started managing the budget, there was never a plan to repay back that that school shift. Now we have one. We've found a way to pay it back. This first $300 million is almost half of what we borrowed for this biennium. So we have a plan to pay that back. The structural deficit actually is about $1.1 billion. That school shift has never really been included in, this, in the school shift. So let's start with that piece. And I don't think there's anybody at the Capitol with a proposal to cut corporate income taxes. There is a plan to reduce the state general levy, the state business property tax. That's a very different tax. So all businesses pay it, whether they're small or large, whether they're losing money or, or actually making a lot of money. They're in Main Street, Minnesota. They're in, in big cities in Minnesota. And about, a th about 30 percent of our businesses' property taxes are actually paid to the state. That's new since 2001. And we don't want the state to be in the business of raising property taxes. That should be for our local government partners. So it's not about corporate income taxes. We're talking about business property, property tax. Property tax, right. Thanks and for the clarification. And that's actually a, a jobs plan for us. Because when these small businesses and large businesses keep more of their money, they can invest it in research and development, in new jobs, in wage increases, in bonuses, in capital equipment. It's all going to turn into economic activity in those communities where our businesses are actually premised. That's the basis of their property tax. So when they save that money, now they've got an opportunity to put it to good use instead of sending it to the state just for more general fund spending. So aside from the corporate property tax. Business property tax. Business property tax, yeah. thank you. Aside from that um, phasing out, eventual phasing yeah. out, what other kind of reforms would you advocate given that Commissioner Showalter did caution, again, that long-term structural reform is needed to try to curb the volatility? 
Well, I totally agree that long-term reform is what Minnesotans are looking for, and that's why we're looking for that repeal of the state business property tax. Because when the business owners can see that the state has a plan, they're much more likely to invest here or expand here. We're likely to be able to recruit more businesses here in Minnesota. Um, are there other tax measures that you would support? There are. That's, that's one of them. We're also looking at uh, the marriage penalty. Minnesotans might know that in 2011, uh, you don't have to pay a penalty if you're married in the federal taxation, but if you have to add income back into your state liability, $1,950 if you happen to be married. We passed that provision last year so that Minnesotans would not have that penalty. The governor vetoed it. He also vetoed our proposal to eliminate the state general levy. So we're working with him to see what our priority, priorities are and why. We also have um, a proposal for a military pay subtraction because I've learned from the Federal Reserve of all groups, they've taught me that when we bring military folks back into Minnesota, they bring all those high-tech skills, they bring leadership, they can be our new CEOs, they can bring an awful lot into our business climate that we need, and they'll bring their families, and that will be economic development. So I, I think those are three really big portions of the work that we're trying to accomplish in the, in the tax committee. Okay, Madam Chair, I want to end with the same question that I began with Commissioner Showalter. What message do you think Minnesotans should take from Wednesday's announcement? We are going to stay the course. The economy is getting better. And I think we should credit the hard work of Minnesotans families and businesses that are helping us to turn this around. We should have faith and keep working because, because we are getting results. Senator Julianne Ortman, thank you for your perspective today. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. The news of a budget surplus and a majority of those funds going to pay back the schools is good news to lawmakers, but Senator Katie Sieben and Representative Ryan Winkler say the districts can be paid back at a faster rate under their proposal. We are proposing to close $450 million a year in loopholes that the corporate, biggest corporations in Minnesota get to pass through this legislature and avoid paying taxes. We think that's wrong. It's time for the state of Minnesota to say that everyone should pay their fair share, both corporations and the richest 2%, and the $450 million in corporate loopholes that we close can pay back the entire school shift in just over five years. The state government shutdown of 2011 had several impacts, including the halt to some road construction projects, horse racing, and business licensing. One proposal before the legislature this year would continue funding state colleges and universities in the event of a government shutdown. The author of the bill is Senator John Carlson from Bemidji. He joins me now. Welcome to Capitol Report, Senator. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with what you've been hearing from constituents, what you did hear from them. When the, shut, when the shutdown occurred? Well, a lot of what I heard was there were so many things that create revenue for the state of Minnesota or did not require appropriations from the state of Minnesota to continue on that uh, it seems silly that we should be stopping those kinds of operations. The budget was resolved before the fall quarter uh, even began for Minsky. So were summer classes impacted at all? Absolutely, because uh, prior to the June 15th declaration by Governor Dayton, there was uncertainty in the Minsky campuses as to whether they were going to be able to continue their summer school programs. And all of the recruiting that goes on during the summer and, and all of the work that, that staff at the Minsky schools go through to prepare for the fall session. So there was a lot of anxiety. Some of the lawmakers do argue that shutting parts of government down adds immense pressure to lawmakers and the governor to reach a budget accord. So how do you respond to this argument? Well, here's what happened in 2001. Governor Ventura, in, in his wisdom, decided that Minsky had its own dollar amount of funding. Uh, they did not require uh, additional appropriations. They had the student fees, they had student tuitions, uh, and determined that at that time that any shutdown would not impact Minsky schools. Governor Dayton did the same thing on June 15th and he issued an order that said basically the same thing so that we now had two different governors of two different parties that came through and said you know really shutting down Minsky does or any of the state colleges and universities did not make any sense they did not require appropriations uh, and it just wasn't in the best interest of Minnesota to do that. So what is the language in your bill then that would essentially take the governors out of this argument altogether? 
other. Right. So by statute, it would allow the Minnesota State School uh, universities and colleges to continue on using their reserve funds that were either from prior appropriations or from their student tuitions, fees, et cetera, uh, to be able to continue on at if they decided to. Now, Minsky, uh doesn't have to do that. It would be their decision and their sole decision by the statute if they would want to continue on during a shutdown. The danger, of course, is if a shutdown lasted for a very long time, they could deplete all their reserves uh, and, and perhaps tuition wouldn't be enough to keep them going. So, so they would have a, a, very, uh, a, a very big decision to make, uh, but at least it would be theirs to make and, and take it out of the hands of the legislature and the governor. Your bill does have strong support, or it did in the Higher Ed Committee. Will Governor Dayton, do you think he would sign this bill if it passes the House and the Senate? I have not spoken directly to the governor. Uh, I, my guess is that he will because of the fact that he had issued the order prior to the shutdown, prior to any final negotiations, and, and got rid of that anxiety at the Minnesota schools uh, and universities and colleges. And, and so uh, it's my hope that, that he would continue on in that vein and, and put that in statute and eliminate that anxiety for the schools. Senator, let's talk a little more broadly about higher ed policy. You sit on the higher ed committee in the Senate. What kind of proposals can you expect to be passed out of committee this session? Well, I hope this will be one of them uh, and, and get this onto the, onto the floor of the House and the Senate and, and into the governor's hands. Uh, uh, another bill that I'm working on is a, a, a textbook bill uh, and, and we're hoping to maybe get that into an omnibus policy bill. Uh, the textbook bill would basically uh, continue to pursue ways for the college students to be able to get the the resources that they need for their classes at a reduced cost. Uh, I think that the textbook manufacturers um, and, and the bookstores have done a very good job in the last few years. I, I believe that our, our, the cost of textbooks is coming down. Um, and a lot of that has to do with new rental programs. It has to do with e-books. So there's a number of things that, uh, that are going on. But we just want to make sure that we're protecting the students uh, in these tough economic times and trying to save them as much money as we can and yet still get uh, the best resources available in their hands. In fact, let's conclude this interview with a discussion about the students. What do you think is the number one concern for any student seeking higher education at this point? I think it's going to be the overall cost and any potential debt load that they would have. You know, a big concern is going to be, gee, you know, not only can I, can I afford to get through these four years, but once I'm through the four years, what kind of a debt load will I have? How long is that going to take me to pay that off? And so we need to do everything we can to, to help minimize those costs to the students, help them with our grant program, uh, help them with uh, uh, the Pell Grants, uh, help them with getting textbook costs down, uh, and also help them by making sure that we don't shut down the Minsky schools so they can get those classes in the summer and graduate on time. Is there anything else that you would like to see done to address those concerns? Well, I, as far as the textbook costs, textbook costs and higher ed costs. Overall. You know, I, obviously, you know, when we as we as we move through this economic downturn that we're in, and, and as as we start seeing our business cycle uptick, uh, I certainly would like to see us get more money into into uh, the all of, all of higher ed, all of our education system, uh, and, and so if we could move that dial, we're probably at somewhere around forty percent. Um, uh, funding uh, for the students. If we could move that up to at least 50 percent, maybe beyond that, I think that would be extremely helpful. Okay, Senator Carlson, thank you for your time Thanks today. Thanks for having me. One month into session, a stadium bill is unveiled. The authors say there is still some work to be done, but this proposal is a good place to start. Now the real work begins. Persuading a majority of the Minneapolis City Council and the Minnesota Legislature to approve this agreement. I ask the council to act expeditiously and the legislature to hold up or down votes in both the House and the Senate during this session. I ask them to consider carefully what is at stake for Minneapolis and for all of Minnesota. Estimates are that building this stadium will employ as many as 8,000 construction workers and an additional 5,000 people among the project suppliers. A couple thousand permanent jobs will be created by its ongoing operations. Our state will have a premier stadium to host the Minnesota Vikings, college and high school teams, rock concerts, monster truck mashes, and other major events that will generate even more economic activity and showcase both Minneapolis and Minnesota to people all over the world. The Minnesota Vikings will play 12 games per year here, 
I'm counting the two home field uh, games you get for winning the league uh, division and then going into the hosting the playoffs. The other 353 days, this publicly owned stadium will be operated by a public authority to best serve the needs, the activities, and the enjoyment of the people of Minnesota. The time has come for Minnesota to make a decision. Uh, Minnesota needs to decide whether or not we in fact do want to keep this team in Minnesota. I do, I'm committed to that. We want to do everything we can to keep them here. And we believe that we have a plan now that stands the best chance of our being successful in getting legislative approval uh, for this uh, new facility to be built. I'd just like to make a, a, a couple comments about uh, why Minnesota is so special and what makes Minnesota special because of the commitment we've made to the things that we love. The Guthrie, the, or the Ordway, the Children's Museum, our 10,000 lakes, to our workforce, on and on. And the Vikings are a very important integral part of that. So right now we need to make a commitment. We have a plan in place, a very good plan. That was my promise to um, my colleagues in the Senate that we will put the very best plan on the table. We believe we have a very compelling case to to make to not only the people on our council but to the people of Minneapolis that this, uh, this arrangement allows us to extend uh, sales taxes that were in jeopardy of being removed from the city. Had that happened, we would have no funding for the convention center or target center, leaving both of those obligations to the property taxpayers. This solves that problem. It also makes a billion dollar investment in the city and puts a lot of folks to work. Regarding the uh, electronic pull tab, so whoever can answer this. Why did you select that source, and why are you confident that that is going to be a steady source of income? Well, it meets the criteria that the uh, legislative leaders have stated, which is no uh, general fund tax dollars, and it's a expanded a part of an existing tax on charitable g gaming, where the beneficiaries are the state of Minnesota and charities uh, all over the state of Minnesota, so it, it provides a benefit for the charities in terms of additional revenue as well as the state. We have an estimate from uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Fran's uh, revenue that $72 million is, is the current projection. Now that, you know, is obviously not locked in because we don't have the operating experience and in terms of selling the bonds if this uh, agreement is uh, pr approved by the legislature and the council we'll have to uh, see what what kind of uh, assurance that we have to provide if, if any beyond that in order to to sell the bonds but uh, and the other advantage of this is as far as we know so far there there won't be any lawsuits uh, questioning our ability to expand this uh, form of, of charitable gaming, and so we don't have a, a period of months or even years where something's tied up in court and not available then to let the project go forward. That wraps up this week's program from all of us at Senate Media and House Public Information Services. I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.